Today we have the curious case of John Thomas McGuire, who fell in love with a girl called Amanda. From a family reunion gone terribly wrong to an incestuous relationship that followed a heinous crime. Then we're taking a look at a man called Lawrence Batter. Or wait, should we call him John Johnson? Is this one of the strangest identity crisis cases that the world has ever seen, or did Bader truly just forget 30 whole years of his life? We're also going to be talking about a young girl named Nicole Van Den Herk, whose stepbrother confessed to killing her decades after her body was discovered, abandoned in the woods. But why did he make a Facebook post announcing that he had killed his sister? In this video, we're taking a look at murders with the scariest plot twists ever. John was killed pretty much right after telling her dad that she was in love with him and wanted to marry him. The judge said that Amanda was attempting to place blame for John's death on her father. The judge went on to say, quote, I don't think that you're taking full responsibility for killing John. You're blaming it on your father. After killing John, you dug him up later. And when you all dug up his body and then dismembered him, you know, he goes on to say, then you reburied him. There was no reason for this. The brutal murder of 38-year-old John Thomas McGuire in February 2019 has been one of the most shocking cases that the world has ever seen. From a deranged family to a love affair gone terribly wrong, some people believe that McGuire was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, which is why he ended up the way that he did. John started dating Amanda sometime in 2019, and together the two spent most of their time doing illegal substances. John and Amanda were both extremely addicted to and did everything in their power to make sure that their supply never ran out. However, things were difficult since neither of them had a steady job to keep fueling their addiction, and when they ran out of money, they ran out of substances. And this is where the problem starts. Now, Amanda had previously been arrested for substance-related crimes multiple times, but what went down with John is something that no one could have seen coming. John was still pretty much in control of his emotions, even when he was going through withdrawal. But the process with Amanda was pretty ugly. The woman would go to any lengths to make sure that her addiction was well-fed. So when the two ran out of money in February 2019 and were kicked out of their house for not paying their rent, Amanda was desperate enough to suggest that the two drive down to West Virginia to go live with her father and ask him for money. Now what's weird is that Amanda was actually adopted and had not really been in contact with her biological family ever. So it was a little strange that in this time of need, she decided to run to her estranged biological father rather than the actual family that had raised her. Rumor has it that Amanda's family knew of her addiction and always tried to make her quit, which is why she had cut off all ties with them. John and Amanda started making their way to West Virginia, but in the middle, their car broke down. So Amanda called her father, Larry, to come pick them up. Now, because Larry couldn't come himself, he called his other daughter, Anna Chudre, to go help her sister out. Anna, just like Amanda, had also been estranged from her father, but it seemed like this would be a big family reunion for them all, at the expense of John's life. Larry and Anna drove down to Indiana together and picked up John and Amanda. The four people then drove back to Larry's trailer, and before that, they made a few stops to purchase ingredients to cook their own crystal. However, they couldn't make it properly and decided to pour the bad batch into a bunch of glass jugs before going out and just buying from a dealer. Over the next week, all four of them stayed intoxicated all the time. And it was during that time that John asked Larry for Amanda's hand in marriage. Pretty sweet, right? But instead of being happy about someone loving his daughter so much, Larry was visibly upset and even angry about the mention of marriage. According to Anna's statements, her father was constantly raging after this conversation with Larry. Him and Amanda started having hushed conversations in locked rooms, and the two would often take off for hours just so they could have some time alone. 
and because John was drugged up most of the time, he didn't really make anything of the situation. Anna didn't interfere either. The family decided to have a special dinner on Valentine's Day on Larry's special request. They had steaks with wine, and as an after-dinner snack, the entire family smoked meth. This is when things started getting a little shady. The entire family sat in the living room after dinner, and Larry asked John if he wanted to play a little trust game. Not knowing what was going on, John decided to say yes. The game started with Larry tying John up to a kitchen chair, and as soon as John was restricted, Anna and Larry went from fun to downright creepy. And let's just say that at this point, John knew that the game wasn't a game anymore. He tried to free himself and untie his legs, but that's when Amanda hit him over the head with a bottle of wine. With John completely immobilized, Larry started shouting things like, who are you, at him. Under some delusion, Larry kept insisting that John was an FBI agent who wanted to arrest his family for their substance abuse. And no matter how much John pleaded, the other three just wouldn't listen. Then, the worst of the worst happened. Larry ordered Anna to inject John with the bad batch of crystal that they had made earlier, saying that it would force the truth out of him. So Anna filled two syringes and injected them into John's carotid artery. But instead of killing him, Anna claims that it only made John stronger since he stayed alive for three days after that, angering Larry to the point where he just wanted to murder him for good. So Larry got Amanda to put a trash bag over John's head while Anna attacked his neck with a rope. Once he stopped breathing, they wrapped him in more bags and buried him right outside their father's trailer. Authorities learned McClure and his biological daughter, Amanda, had an incestual relationship and were married in Tazewell County one month after the alleged murder. We have had three preliminary hearings for each of the three co-defendants. So that's that, right? Nope. In a twisting turn of events, after John was dead, Larry and Amanda started dating each other. What? According to Anna, the two began an intimate and romantic relationship, which is what perplexed the authorities the most. But when they dug into Larry's history, they found out the reason why his daughters did not grow up with him was because their father had a streak of engaging in pedophilia and had actually served time for violating a minor. And the worst part is, back when he was engaging in the crime, his daughters were around the same age as his victim. I don't know about you, but I definitely have the shutters. Both Amanda and Anna then gave statements about Larry being extremely possessive over Amanda, not wanting anyone else to go near her, which is why he ended up killing John. Amanda then revealed that in the days leading up to the murder, Larry would take her away and try to convince her that John was an agent who was trying to bust the daily for their crimes. And well, because Amanda was so intoxicated all of the time, she had a hard time differentiating between reality and delusion, so she went along with the plan. And in this paranoia, six days after John's murder, Larry convinced his daughters into thinking that he was still alive. So they dug up his body and stabbed him with wooden stakes, mutilating him just to make sure he didn't magically come back to life and haunt them. And if that was gross, wait until you hear the next part. Larry and Amanda actually got married to each other while Anna was the only attendee and witness to their unholy matrimony. Suspect, a registered sex offender, turned himself in for failing to notify state police of a new address in Kentucky. September 2019, state troopers were questioning Larry Paul McClure at the Welch Detachment for violating his sex offender registry. That's when McClure revealed shocking information, leading investigators down a dark and twisted path of murder and incest. He told them about a murder in McDowell County that happened seven months prior on February 14th, 2019. Of course, John's family eventually reported him missing. Larry and Amanda were now living as husband and wife on John's social security checks and even moved to Kentucky, where Larry hid his identity as a sex offender. Fortunately, he was arrested in September 2019 for not registering, and in one go, he confessed to his crimes. 
But what the man did was that he claimed that Amanda was the mastermind behind John's murders and that she forced him to act on her orders. He then told the police where they would be able to find John's body just so he would receive a lesser penalty while throwing his daughters, one of them being his wife, under the bus. We did respond to the, uh, to the residence where the crime occurred and uh, the victim's remains were found on the property. Here at the scene, we discovered a path leading to some disturbed ground that looks a lot like a shallow grave. This is a man who clearly has no regard for human life, clearly no, and no regard for the safety of his daughters, but he was worried that the cost of a trial would just be too much for taxpayers. According to the Bluefield Daily Telegraph newspaper, the father wrote in this letter, quote, I just want it over. No trial. No taxpayers' money spent for a trial. I plead guilty, no contest. Thank you for your time on this matter. After the investigation kicked off, of course, the police found John's horrifically damaged body. And in October, Larry, Amanda, and Anna were arrested, with the latter two being charged for first-degree murder, while Amanda was charged for second-degree murder, testifying against her sister. To help the case, Larry confessed to his part in the crime and was sentenced to life without parole in August 2020. Two months later, Amanda spoke up in her sentence hearing about her father's obsession with her, and to help her case, her adoptive parents also came out and spoke of their experiences with Larry. But while there is a history of Larry abusing and manipulating Amanda all of her life, she was still sentenced to 40 years in jail for John's murder. Anna also received 40 years after she claimed that her father had threatened to kill her and her children, which is why she went ahead with this ugly crime. And while this puts an end to this incredibly disturbing story, we still don't know what really went down in that house the night that John was murdered and whether anyone in this story is really as innocent as they seem. What would you do if someone came up to you and asked you if you were someone else? Naturally, you would think that that person had just mistaken you for whomever they thought you were. But what if that wasn't good enough for them? What if they came back with another person and they too were entirely certain that you were this other person? Lawrence Joseph Bader, or Larry as the world knew him, was a happy man with everything one could ever want a 30-year-old kitchen appliance salesman and an occasional archer living in Ohio. Larry loved his job. He had three amazing children and a doting pregnant wife. So from the outside, it seemed like everything was A-OK -okay in the Bader household. They were the picture-perfect American family. However, what most people didn't know was that Larry was actually under a massive amount of debt that he just couldn't pay off, no matter how hard he worked. His wife reports Larry being incredibly worried about all the money that he owed, and a few days later he told his family he was going on a fishing trip. Now, since that was nothing out of the ordinary for the man, no one thought that much of it, until he failed to return back home. His family waited and waited, but Larry was never seen or heard from ever again. After a thorough investigation was kicked off, the authorities discovered that Larry had leased a boat all alone on the Rocky River. The people there warned him about an upcoming storm, but Larry didn't seem to mind and went ahead with his plans. At around 4.30, he set sail in his rented motorboat, and three hours after he went out on the water, a huge storm hit the area. The only thing that the police could find was Larry's boat, which was discovered on the rocks near Perkins Beach a day after he was last seen. But of course, the man himself was nowhere to be found. The Coast Guard claimed that the storm was so violent that no one braving the waters could have survived, putting an end to the story and life of Lawrence Bader in 1957. But then eight years later, in a shocking turn of events, Larry's niece, Suzanne Pieca, stumbled upon a man who looked exactly like her dead uncle. It was February 2nd, 1965, when Suzanne came across a man who was a dead ringer for her uncle, who had supposedly passed away in a boating accident. She saw him at a sporting goods convention in Chicago, introducing himself as John Fritz Johnson. 
After poking and probing, Suzanne found out that the man had been living in Omaha for about eight years, as long as Larry had been dead. He was a radio announcer and a local television celebrity who was loved by the people in Omaha. What's even surprising is that the man was also an expert archer, just like Larry, and had even gone on to win the Nebraska State Championship. When Suzanne tried to get him to recognize her, the man brushed it off and said that the girl was probably mistaken. But this was too big of a coincidence to just be ignored like that. So, Suzanne called up her family and together, the two convinced the police to investigate. They called Fritz in for his fingerprints to see if they matched Larry's, and the man quietly obliged, just because he wanted to settle the matter once and for all. But what no one saw coming was the fact that the fingerprints were a perfect match. This man was no one else but Larry Bader. And while his friends and wife, Nancy Zimmer, had heard plenty of tales of a completely different life that Fritz had allegedly lived, no one could deny the hard truth that was right in front of their eyes. According to Fritz, the man had grown up in an orphanage in Boston and had served in the Navy for 13 years. He also claimed that he had to remove a malignant tumor from his left eye, which is why he wore an eye patch. Now, some of these details, such as working in the Navy, aligned with Larry Bader's life, while other details were completely made up. When questioned, the man was just as confused as everyone else and claimed that he had no recollection of his life as Lawrence Bader. But was that what was really happening here? Let's go back to the day when Larry disappeared. Before heading out, he told his wife that he was going to Cleveland for some business and that he was going to go fishing afterward. When his wife suggested that maybe he skip the fishing and come straight home, he gave a cryptic answer and said, maybe I will, maybe I won't. Three to five days after his disappearance, people report a man named John Johnson showing up at Ross's Steakhouse in Omaha. The man was there looking for a job and had a suitcase, multiple bags, and a Navy-issued driver's license. The story that the man told was that he had just left the Navy and was looking for a job before he went out to travel the country. This is where he started telling people his orphanage origin story. He then made his way to the top, first landing a job on a radio station, and then becoming a TV sports presenter. The whole of Omaha knew him as Fritz. But... When the real story came out into the open, there were tons of questions to be answered. Was Fritz actually a fraud who had escaped his previous debt-ridden life to take on a new identity and leave his old one behind? Of course, this led to Bader's wife, Mary Lou, entering the picture and traveling to Chicago to meet her estranged husband. But of course, while Mary Lou instantly knew the man was her husband, Fritz claimed he had no recollection of their marriage or their family. And while Mary Lou hoped that he would eventually come around, there was nothing that the law could do when the man kept insisting he just didn't remember 30 years of his entire life. But of course, this identity change comes with tons of complications for the man that Omaha once loved. The entire ordeal created a lot of doubt about Fritz's credibility, and he lost his job along with his reputation. The only job he could then find was at a bar in the city with most of his money going towards Nancy and Mary Lou, since the man was now legally married to both of them and had to pay reparations. Sadly, in 1966, he died of cancer, putting an end to his mysterious tale. Dissociative amnesia occurs when we, number one, have an inability to recall autobiographical information, usually from traumatic or stressful events and it's inconsistent with ordinary forgetting. Meaning we can't remember things that happened to us, and it usually happens during times of trauma or stress. To this day, no one knows whether Bader Johnson was actually telling the truth about suffering from some unknown kind of disassociative amnesia, or if the man really just faked his own death to escape life's troubles and become someone else. As far as amnesia goes, the condition isn't uncommon, and people do disassociate from their lives when they go through unexpected trauma and stress, which is what Bader was experiencing with all of that debt he was under. So while it is possible that he could have momentarily forgotten who he was and where he came from, doctors believe there is no way that his memories didn't come back to him at all for over 30 years. 
So chances are that while Bader probably did suffer some temporary memory loss, he decided to stay in denial once his memories did come back and adopt a brand new life where he was free to be who he wanted until his old one sadly caught him. Nicole Van Den Herk could have been one of the many young girls that go missing, their cases forgotten, and their culprits roaming free. If it wasn't for her stepbrother, who decided to risk it all to try and bring justice to the young girl. October 6, 1995 was a pretty ordinary day. Nicole was 15 at the time and had stayed the night at her grandmother's house, like she usually did. In the morning, she decided to take her bicycle to the nearby shopping center where she worked. However, after her disappearance, her aunt mentioned how the girl had been a little stressed out since an unknown man had harassed her the night before while she was on her way home. However, the girl made it out to be a one-time thing and then headed out. But sadly, Nicole never made it to work, and that was quite unlike her. So the police were called and a search party was sent out to look for her. And while Nicole's bicycle was found later that evening, lying down by a river, Nicole herself was nowhere to be found. For the next few days, everyone in the town spent hours and hours looking for the young girl. But it wasn't until November that a few people stumbled upon her dead body in the woods. An autopsy showed that Nicole had been violated and tortured before being brutally murdered. She had a fractured jaw, injuries to her head and fingers, and a jab wound that was most likely the cause of her death. Of course, this situation sent her whole town into a frenzy, with the police working overtime to find whoever was the brutal killer behind this crime. But months and even years into the investigation, the authorities found nothing. The Dutch police actually ended up arresting Nicole's stepfather and stepbrother, Andy. But once again, that was just a desperate move to give the public some kind of closure. The two men, however, were cleared of all accusations and let off immediately. With no leads at all, the case slowly went cold. And in 2004, the detectives officially stopped working on it. But while the world had forgotten Nicole's ruthless murder, his family struggled to find closure and wondered what had happened to their daughter every single day. In 2011, Nicole's brother Andy moved to England for a fresh start. But the idea of his sister's killer roaming free just didn't let him think of anything else. For a while, he tried to get the police to restart their investigation since he believed that new DNA technology could help solve the mystery. What Andy wanted the investigators to do was examine any DNA material that could be found on whatever was left of Nicole's corpse. But when he wasn't met with a response, he decided to do something that could have destroyed his life forever. Shocking the whole world, Andy turned himself into the police on March 8, 2011. He posted on Facebook and confessed to the crime of murdering his sister. Of course, this led to the case being opened once again, and the investigation was kicked off just like Andy wanted. But of course, the police couldn't find any evidence to support his claims, and he was let off once again. However, what this stunt did was that the authorities agreed to start working on the case, examining whatever DNA evidence remained on Nicole's body. As per Andy's wishes, Nicole's body was exhumed. He set himself up so that the police could initiate the process and get the DNA off of her body. And that's exactly what happened. When asked why he did what he did, Andy just claimed that he loved his sister and that he misses her every day. So to bring justice to her untimely death, he did whatever he thought would work, even if it meant taking on the risk of a lifetime. As far as the investigation goes, when Nicole's remains were examined, the police found DNA material from three different men. The first one was Nicole's boyfriend, who was never even considered a suspect since he had a solid alibi. The second was an unknown person, and the third, and most important one, was from a man named Joe's De G, a convicted assaulter and abuser. Upon further probing, it was discovered that the man had been convicted for violation three different times and had been placed under psychiatric care in 2001 for one of his crimes. 
The case was eerily similar to Nicole's, where the man had grabbed a young girl from her bicycle and taken her to the woods to assault her. The only difference was that he didn't murder the poor girl, while Nicole had to pay with her life. After being called into questioning, it was discovered that DG had fought with his ex-girlfriend prior to Nicole's murder, which is why he had taken all his anger out on the poor girl. After DG's confession, the police arrested and charged him with rape and murder, but the court only found DG guilty of assault while he was acquitted of the murder charges. His sentence was a mere five years in prison, and of course this was unacceptable for Nicole's family. The reason why this happened was because of the presence of a third person's DNA on Nicole's body, which threw the authorities off. But later on, it was decided that the DNA could have come from anywhere and held no particular meaning for the case. So when Nicole's family filed an appeal, DG was found guilty on both counts and was sentenced to 12 years of imprisonment, nearly 20 years after the actual crime, all thanks to a brave brother who refused to let the world forget his sister's brutal death. Sadly, the toll of his sister's loss was still too much for Andy to take. And in 2021, he ended up taking his own life in his home. He made his final post on Facebook on August 25th, 2021, stating that he was ready to say goodbye, showing just how much his sister's murder impacted him and how much he longed to be with her.